be live. I sure like to think I am. When I tried to put the uh, announcement on my community tab earlier today, for some reason, YouTube would not allow my space bar to work. I have no idea why it worked. Hey, for some reason, no. YouTube would not allow... I forgot to mute the YouTube side. Anyway, the uh, YouTube wouldn't allow the damn thing to work. And, uh, you know, I finally got put commas in there. It wouldn't work when I was writing the... Uh, writing up the little announcement and it wouldn't work when I was answering comments, but it worked everywhere else. So who knows what kind of foolishness YouTube has gotten up to. Anyway, uh, for a little topic today, I was going to take questions and see who was out in the, uh, out in the comment section. And, uh, I was going to show you some of the tools you'll need if you want to clean up and restore cast iron. Uh, one of them, you can see in the back there, that's my lye bath. That works really good, that or uh, oven cleaner, to strip off the built-up crud and debris. You know, for something like that and for uh, an electrolysis tank, I just use big plastic totes. They're fairly cheap. You can get them at the dollar store for a few dollars a piece. They'll last you a few years, and, uh, you know, if they crack or break, you can throw them out and it's no big loss. It's not a huge investment. But... Once you get the crud loosened up with lye or oven cleaner or an electrolysis tank even, you probably want something to scrape it off. And for that, you'll need a putty knife. Uh, cheap plastic ones are great. They work just fine. You know, and they only cost, you can get them two for a dollar a lot of places. If you use a metal one, you sh it's best if you round the corners off a little bit on them because you don't want to scratch or gouge the uh, cast iron when you're scraping the crud off don't really need to dig hard with these usually you're not trying to you know trying to break up the really hard stuff you want to use this just to scrape loose the uh loose stuff after it's been softened up by whatever you're using to clean it let me set that over here set it over here uh if you're using a lie tank or or uh oven cleaner you should really get yourself a pair of rubber gloves. These are pesticide gloves you know, for pesticide applications. You can get them at Farm and Fleet or Menards. And they're nice long ones. They come up your wrist pretty good ways. If you have smaller hands, they'll come up even higher. They're fairly tough. They don't wear through really easy, but you can snag them and rip them pretty easy. So you kind of want to watch out for that. But it's nice to have something that's longer than just a pair of you know, rubber gloves like you get at a doctor's office or something like that, or examination gloves. Although those usually will work too. So, get yourself some of them. Let's see who's up here. We got Caitlin Clority from McFarland, Wisconsin. Ron Scratch, he's out there. Four Day Homestead, Deb Ramage, LJ Jackson. Nice to see y'all. Jessica, she's hiding. We got somebody from northern Indiana, Flatlands, Boiler Honky Dude. He's always good to have around. Once you got your pan, you run it through your uh, cleaning process to get the buildup off of it. You're going to need to scrub it. And just for daily scrubbing, you'll need something. I usually use these stainless steel scrubbers. You know, these are Dawn brand. There's a lot of different brands. Dawn, Mr. Clean. You know, some of them have are unbranded. There's all kinds of them around. You can usually find these in grocery stores, hardware stores. You know, wherever the dish soap and household cleaner and scrub, cleaning and scrubbing supplies are. With these things, they usually come in a two-pack, sometimes a three-pack. But what I'll do with them is I'll take two of them. And you stack them on top of each other. Kind of squeeze them down a little bit and you just roll them together like you would a pair of socks you just roll them around each other a couple of times and you get a lot bigger pad to work with these do wear out eventually you know they'll start breaking up and losing little bits and pieces of them but they last pretty good you know and they're great for using for everyday 
cleaning and scrubbing of your pans if you have stuff stuck to them. And, uh, you know, the first scrubbing right after you take them out of the lye tank or out of the uh, oven cleaner and rinse them off, these are really good because they'll knock off bigger, harder chunks really easy. And, uh, it's, you know, probably the primary thing that I use for cleaning up my iron. Also, wire brushes come in really handy. You can get a big one like this. This is uh, for painting. You know, Purdy is a brand name of painting tools. And it's nice and big for doing the bottom of a skillet or, you know, a big griddle. And it really works good. But you, there's different sizes, different shapes. Uh, this is a grill brush. It's got a scraper on the front. And sometimes that's kind of handy and sometimes it's in the way. I haven't really decided yet. I might just trim that off so I can get right up to the edge of the pan with the bristles on the brush. These aren't terribly expensive either. And uh, it's stainless steel. You don't want to use a brass brush on cast iron because it'll leave brass residue behind. The iron is a bit harder than the brass is. And it'll get kind of a brownish golden look to it. But eventually that brass will turn green and it'll, you know, as it, uh, as it oxidizes, that brass will turn green and it'll look really silly and you don't need brass smeared on the bottom of your iron pan. You can also use nylon bristle brushes if you can find a good stiff one. They work pretty good. But a uh, wire brush really comes in handy for stuff like that. One thing that's really handy is something like this. This is a grout brush for scrubbing the grout between your tile and the bathroom. And these are great for cleaning up waffle irons, getting into, you know, tight little corners and nooks and crannies. Or, uh, you know, something like a corn stick pan. They work really good for getting into narrow spots. And these are, you know, they're, like I say, they're with, uh, you know, they're usually with the uh, cleaning supplies, brushes, mops, and such. And they're not terribly expensive. One more handy wire brush to have are some of these little they look like a wire toothbrush these are nice for getting in nooks and crannies and corners and such and uh i can't remember where i found these in the store but anyway these are very expensive they're like 75 80 cents a piece and usually it's you know three or four of them to a pack ah loretta corner from comer rather from ohio Hi, Loretta. Nice to see you. Okay. Now, what else to have? Oh, yeah. Uh, these guys. Sometimes you get stubborn stuff stuck in the lettering of a logo or something like that. And to pick that out, I use these guys. It's way too bright on them. Use that plastic. This is a precision hook set. There's different shapes of them. There's a straight pick. There's one that's trying to give you something. A little background so you can see them better. But that's a uh, right angled one. Some got a little more bend. And you got actual hooks. And you can get down and pick the stuff out of lettering with these. I got these at a, at an auto supply shop years ago. And they're pretty cheap too. They're not, you know, and I'd be willing to bet Menards or Lowe's. Or something like that would probably have these too so you can get a set of these and they are real handy to get down and you know dig bits of stuff out of lettering that just doesn't really want to come out but other than that once you get uh get your first scrubbing done right before i season them i'll give them one last scrubbing with either you know a scotch bright pad or sos pads you know and those are in every grocery store so those are easy to come by and that's really it that you need for tools for uh for uh cleaning up and restoring cast iron that'll do probably you know 99 percent of what you need to do to it every now and then there might be some thing that might be handy that you don't have but i don't have it either i mean this is the stuff that i use all the time for all the things that i do uh you know i've already done a video on setting up and running a lye bath and I'm going to reinvent my electrolysis tank. I've done, it's been in videos before, but when I redo that, I'll do another video on that, you know, a little more specific. 
So, but that's going to wait until summer when it's uh, a little bit warmer out. Let me check my... Get my glasses on so I can see. Uh, you're not terribly late, Brian. You haven't missed all that much. And uh, let's see, Deb Killer Miller, he's here. Good to see him. Bookworm73, Pawpaw Dan. Yeah, that's really all you need for a... Uh, you know, a good start on getting cast iron cleaned up and restored. There's not a huge amount of uh, equipment that you need for it. You know, it's mostly just a matter of scrubbing it, a little bit of elbow grease. And most of it even isn't that hard because a lye bath or oven cleaner electrolysis tank will take off most of the hard buildup crud on there and you'll be in pretty good shape. So other than that, uh, in my last video, I uh, refinished the top of my stove and I've had a slow fire going on it all day and I wipe it down every now and then and it's really coming along good. I figured out how I can rearrange the big panels on the top and uh, I can always shift the lids around to where it's hottest and it's darkening up real good and the next video I make I'll uh, you know do a little update on that but that's definitely turning out pretty nice. You know it looks better now than it did right after right when i made the video a little bit of the rust still shows through but uh once i get to where i can just think i can just leave it i'll use it for a while longer because uh you know it does get dry you know a dry look to it but it's getting a nice dark color to it and uh i think i'll definitely put all the pieces in the electrolysis tank over the summer and really get the rust out and then refinish it and i think that'll turn out just beautifully when it's yeah, when it's really restored right now it's just kind of more of an experiment and uh you know i'm not terribly worried about how it's going to turn out exactly but it's looking pretty good right now in fact maybe i could take you over there and grab my camera i'm still here don't worry i'll have to flip my light around a little bit too I don't have quite enough cord and the light ain't the greatest on that. But you can see where the fire is hottest there. It's uh got that dry look and it's still a little bit, you know, oily looking over here, but it doesn't pick up any residue like it did with that stove polish. I really tickled the way it's going so far. But I'll do like I say, I'll do a little bit of an update on that with my next video. I'll move everybody back. I oh, got that light now. Let me move that away. That looks a little better too with the lighting. Get myself all organized back in my chair. Come on, you. There we go. Ah, there. Back from our little road trip. Yeah, that's really starting to come along good, Kim. And uh, like I say, once I get that run through the electrolysis tank and get that old rust off of there that'll really look nice because it does show through a little bit and i'm not going to build it up a whole lot more i've just been wiping it down you know with a rag that has some of that easy beasy seasoning on it and uh it's going really good and i figured out you know different ways where i can position the different pieces over the hottest part of the fire because on those top sections Two of them have a lip on the bottom so that the the edge of the next one can sit over it and one has no lips at all and I can flip them around and rearrange them pretty good now so 
Oh, your stole still in pieces? Yeah, it takes a bit of doing on some of them to get them all back together, but once you get it cleaned up and going, you know, you'll be tickled to death with it. Back up on my comments here. Let's see, I already said hi to Kim. I don't know, I can actually read the comments. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to worry about getting cast iron perfect. You know, I mean, it's going to, as long as you start it off halfway right, it'll get better as you go along and haven't done any real damage to it. You know, there's not many things you can really do wrong with cast iron. A lot of it's just a matter of personal preference, really. You know, how you uh, season it and how you maintain it. You know, there's not really like i said there's not really a whole lot of things that are actually wrong and even in those cases there's usually an exception or two to it like you shouldn't uh i mean you shouldn't sand cast iron down or sandblast or anything like that until you know exactly what you're doing you know and exactly what you're dealing with because you don't want to go grinding off a logo or something that's you know rare and unusual and turn out that you destroyed it but you know, I, like I did in that video there where it had a badly pitted pan. And I already knew what it was. I cleaned it up and identified it. So just uh, smooth it up enough to be useful again. You know, and you'll be fine and dandy. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a nice little stove, and it's, you know, that's not even a top-of-the-line model, really. That's kind of a mid-range stove. I mean, there were bigger ones. There were some hugely, hugely ornate ones, especially from the late 1800s with, you know, tons of nickel plating and scroll work and all of that. But, uh, you know, this one here works just great, and it looks pretty good, too. One of these days, I might get something a little better for the hinges on the oven door. A little more attractive than the cobbled together ones that are on there but uh i saw one i stopped off at an antique shop yesterday and i saw one that was just about identical it was really the same basic design that feed door on the firebox was a little bit different other than that it was identical design and uh it had the white panels on it and it was a dark blue it was really beautiful stove and uh they weren't selling it right then they just had it all for display but that'd be a really neat stove to have really pretty uh have i cooked or baked anything really good lately uh the last thing i cooked on it was that that uh stir fry i did you know i've been playing around refinishing it but you know, i'm sure i'll make i'll get a few more things cooked up on it in a few videos before uh it starts getting too hot to run it all the time because it warms it up and you're pretty good. I've had just a slow, gentle fire going at it all day because it was raining and it was about 35, 40, which is pretty good for this time of year. But once it got the house warmed up from cooling off overnight, now it's getting warm in here. I'm just about to the point where I'll start sweating if I actually started moving around doing something right now. Oh, uh, the two skillets. Which ones are those? Oh, there's three there actually. Uh, two of them I had just washed. One of them is an old uh, gate marked skillet. I don't know if ever this is the first gate marked actual skillet I've gotten. I've got a couple of uh, of griddles that are gate marked, but that is what a gate marked pan looks like. That's the gate mark right there. That's the uh, scar where the opening into the mold was where he poured the iron into it. And these are just unbelievably light and thin. I mean, this weighs two and a half pounds, maybe. And most of them aren't marked as far as a manufacturer. I mean, eight is the size of this and T, who knows what that is. But you can kind of tell by the style of the handle, you know, and one that kind of comes up like that and has this sort of a design to it those are made from about 1860 to 1890 and uh there's a lot of demand for the old gate marked ones because they're just so light i mean it's unreal 
some of them, I mean, you would hardly believe that they're actually made out of cast iron. You pick it up. But yeah, that was, I got that fairly recently, got it fairly cheap. It was $16, which is unreal because uh, a lot of times I see ones like that going for $100, $150 on auction sites. And yeah, that's, I'm really tickled to death to have that thing. That's the first, you know, the first gate mark skillet that I've had. Am I still doing sourdough? Yeah, I haven't made sourdough in a while. I've made a couple loaves of bread, which reminds me i got to feed that starter here pretty soon. It's getting, it's been kind of neglected for a month or two. But that's the nice thing with sourdough. Once you got got a starter really well established, it will, uh, you can keep it in the fridge for a long time without feeding it. There we go. Uh, should hand forge kitchen tools be seasoned like cast iron pans? Yeah, it would. It would definitely help them. You know, get a get a uh, good coating on them to prevent rust. Yeah, some of these, uh, the handle design, some of those have really ornate handles. A lot of squirrel work and little floral designs in them. Uh, I haven't seen, actually seen any of them in real life, but I've seen pictures of them on different websites and what, and they're really cool, them handles. Uh, have I started my catalog yet? Not yet. You know, I mean, I've been a little bit busy, and I'm, I mean, by the catalog, I mean the, uh, on the webs, on the, uh, Facebook group where I was hoping to get kind of a identification guide going. But yeah, that's, uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to organize it, you know, so you can get, uh, you know, have some place, nowhere to look know where to start looking for things you know and that's a lot of times that's the hardest part of trying to identify something that's unknown is you know where do you start looking for it because you got no idea what what to call it you know so you can't just you know google birmingham stove and range if you don't know that it was made by birmingham stove and range in the first place which yeah, that's another little project that i got up in the uh up in the air, I got about 30 different things going on at any given time, and usually half of them are running at once, and none of them are getting done. Oh, good, Papa Dan. I'm glad you're not freezing up your video in Louisiana. Yeah, I don't know what the, what the deal was with the space bar not working earlier today it worked everywhere else leaving comments on other videos it was just fine it was just on the community tab and trying to respond to anybody that commented on the community tab it was just the damnedest thing yeah alphabetical order is handy like i say it's kind of hard to tell i mean if you don't if there's no markings on a skillet and you don't know what it is you know, how do you, out, you know, how would you know where to look to begin with? But, yeah, I'll probably end up doing alphabetical order. Uh, gifted some Pampered Chef cast iron works okay, but you're not sure. Thinking about redoing them and trying to redo the inside surface. Yeah, you can sand them down. You know, I don't, you know, like with vintage pans, you know, I seldom need to because they're really smooth right from the beginning anyway. And, uh. Unless it's badly pitted, I don't usually do that. But with like newer lodge or the pampered chef or some of the imported cast iron, it really does help them a bit. Just take some 50 grit sanding discs on a random orbital sander and smooth it up on the inside. You don't have to get every, uh, you don't have to get all the pits out. You know, as long as you leave, you know, turn the pits into dimples, you'll be okay because as long as there's no sharp edges on them, it'll uh just fill with oil as you're cooking and it's no problem so you don't have to get it perfectly smooth and you don't have to uh i see some people they'll just they'll polish it i mean they'll go with finer and finer sandpaper and have a nice mirror finish well 
you don't need to go nearly that far to begin with. And something like that can be tough to get it to seize it. It does need a bit of texture for the seasoning to really bond to the iron. And if it's too smooth, there's nothing really to grab onto. So when you sand it down, you know, that last video I did where I sanded that lodge pan down, that was just 50 grit sandpaper. That's all the farther I went as far as the coarseness of the sandpaper. Uh, do you have, yeah, I have an electric stove that I use when I'm not using the wood stove. Uh, stove enamel. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, there are places that can re-enamel things, but I haven't really looked into it all that much. Uh, sometimes you can use like appliance touch-up paint if it's someplace that's not going to get too hot. And, uh, and uh, Brenda in the chat there, she had mentioned she was thinking about using uh, tub refinishing, you know, or the re-enamel a bathtub. But that's actually an epoxy, and I don't know uh, what kind of a temperature range it'll be able to stand. The sides of the stove don't get nearly as hot as the cooktop does, but you know, especially towards the firebox, it still does get pretty warm. If you can find a, an epoxy type thing that had a high enough temperature range, that would probably work. And uh, you know, do a real glass enamel because you know, true enamel is powdered glass it has some binders like clay and water in it and, and uh it gets mixed up to where it's like a paint and then they fire it in the kiln and the glass melts and bonds to the uh to the enamel or bonds to the iron rather so uh, there are places that'll do that but i bet it's probably fairly expensive Uh, you have all your grandma's cast. What uh, is it? Just is it all uh, you know different mixed brands? Are you looking for any particular brand of Dutch oven and griddle or? Let's see. Yeah, a lot of the imported stuff is machined nice and smooth, and uh, a lot of it isn't. You know, it's kind of hit and miss with the. Uh, with the uh, imported stuff, you gotta get a little bit of a knack of recognizing what's good and what's bad and what's worth messing with. <laughs> well, as long as you get there first before the cousins do, you can usually do pretty good. <laughs> Older stuff. Yeah, I've got... Uh, you know, one of my favorite frying pans is a little made in Taiwan skillet. And it's just fantastic. It's nice and smooth. It's thin. It's light. You know, it does everything you could want it to do. Yeah, I mean, there's no real best brand of vintage cast iron. You know, some people, you know, just kind of love uh, Birmingham stove and range. Some people collect Griswold stuff. You know, yeah, I got a little bit of everything and getting more and more of little bits of everything. I'd rather have one or two nice examples of a, a particular maker or, a, you know, style logo rather than getting the entire set of every possible size of that particular design. Open my other can. And, you know, I've always said, you know, you should really buy the pan before you buy the brand. You know, most, a lot of the stuff that I get is heavily built up and you can't see anything on it anyway. And you just get a little bit of practice, you know, handling cast iron and uh, looking at different things. You'll be able to tell more or less when it was made and whether or not it's a decent pan at all. Or uh, even if you can tell that it's something that's fairly new and uh, imported, if you get a little bit of an eye for it, you can you can tell what a good pan looks like regardless of who made it. Hi, Wayne. 
from South Florida. Raymond is in South Florida too. Yeah, old cast iron is uh, on auction sites last since before Christmas. The prices have just been going nuts on vintage cast iron. You know, at first it was because it pretty much always spikes before Christmas because, you know, getting Christmas presents for your family or yourself or just going to treat yourself. But usually it comes down again by mid-January or so. But this year, it's just been going nuts. I've seen a lot of things going for twice what they really should be. And uh, I'm not really sure why. It could be panic buying. You know, some of us probably people are counting on getting a stimulus check or something like that and they figure, well, they'll treat themselves now and cover it when the check comes in. And uh, some of us probably panic buying after the uh, storms of Texas and a lot of people had lost power. Everybody all of a sudden decides, well, I'm going to have to get some cast iron cookware so I can cook on a campfire in case everything goes to hell and the grid collapses. And I'm stuck cooking open over an open fire and decide, well, you, know, you might as well go with the nice vintage ones. So, but it's, you know, it's really kind of weird. Hopefully it'll settle down before too long because I'm a cheap bastard. I don't like paying too much for anything, especially not cast iron. Actually, instead of uh, auction sites or something like that online, right now your best bet is antique stores. Because antique stores don't usually change the prices on their stock all that often. You know, they're not going out there every couple of days and remarking all the tags on all the knickknacks and things that they got. So it's, uh, you know, you're probably going to find your best deals right now in, uh, in antique stores because most places you haven't really started the flea market season yet. And, uh, I suspect flea markets and things like that will be pretty high because they kind of judge your prices by what things are going for on eBay. And eBay is just going nuts on a lot of things right now. So that'd be, you know, if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking for uh, vintage cast iron, I would start looking into the antique stores again a little more because, you know, normally they're a bit higher. You're going to pay more of a full retail price. Although a lot of them will give you a break, you can talk them down on the price. But uh, you can still find things at secondhand stores that, you know, that gate mark pan. I got I got this in the secondhand store. It was a good, you know, it was a Goodwill or Savers anyway. One of them, you know, in sixteen dollars for something like that. You know, there's still still some pretty cool stuff out there in, uh, you know thrift shops and whatnot and uh we'll see what happens with the flea market season once it starts because uh you know it sounds kind of morbid and, and it is and even with the uh thrift stores it really picks up in late spring early summer because grandma didn't make it through the winter and the kids are finally getting around to cleaning out her house and donating stuff to uh you know, Goodwill or thrift shops like that, or say visit to Paul. Over the winter, it kind of slows down and you don't see very much of anything. And then all of a sudden, you know, April, May, June, and there, all of a sudden there's a big flood of cast iron and uh, other kinds of cookware. You know, and that's the reason why. Yeah, I really like that gate mark pan. It really cooks nice, too. Uh, 1060R. Uh, let me think here. Wagner started using the four-digit uh, catalog number on the bottom of the pans in 1924. So it could be as old as that, but most likely... Uh, do, does it say uh, Made in USA on it? Any chance? I'm asking Ron Scratcher as a Wagner wear number 10. Actually, if you got a webcam, it'd be easiest just for me to put a link out there and you could join in the show. 
show what it looks like. Yeah, I got tons of used junk around here. I'm a laborer and I do a lot of demolition work, so most of the doors and a lot of the odds and ends in my house are things that I've salvaged out of different demolition jobs over the years. Yeah, Ron, if that uh, that uh, Canadian, Canadian, reading Canadian castaholic's name there, if that Wagnerware pan says made in the USA, it was made after 1964, but more than likely it was made between probably about 1940 and 1960. That's kind of the kind of the general run of them. Yeah, I'm always interested in, you know, whatever comes next, really, you know, because uh, there's a few things that I'd really like to have, but uh, mostly I just kind of go with whatever I find, whatever interests me at the moment, and if it looks like something worth having or something I don't have, at least, you know, one example of, I'll grab it. You know, I've passed up on a lot of stuff because I've got, you know, four or five number eight Wagner Ware skillets that are all the same and you know i don't really need to get another one unless i have a reason to or i'm looking for somebody else to get them on but in that case well i got four or five of them sitting here but uh you know there's a lot of different brand names different uh different items i got a uh, picked up a long griddle here for a couple of bucks got it for next to nothing it's an unmarked one it's got a little bit of a warp to it but it'll work and it's kind of a cool griddle. Let's see here. Things are dried up in Georgia. Last score was a Sydney Hollowware number eight. Yeah, 40 bucks is a good price for that. Like I say, you know, antique stores, you know, probably your best bet right now if you're looking for older cast iron. In fact, I got it sitting in the, uh, lie bath right now i got a favorite it's a number nine number nine yeah it's a uh favorite wear skillet that i just got at a antique store for i think it was 35 bucks it's a pretty nice one it's the uh it has the favorite wear best to cook in logo on it and uh once i get that cleaned up and when i do my next uh members only stream if you want to see that you should have to join the channel but uh when i do the uh next members only stream i think i'll do a little history on what i have for favorite pico wear and uh chicago hardware foundry because they ended up merging in the 1930s and they all kind of run together so it's kind of a common kind of a common story between the two of them you know they'll both work out good. I uh, will see you, Caitlin. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, hit the like button because that that gets more and more. Uh, you know, it always helps with the algorithm because who knows what the YouTube algorithm is going to be like this week. And uh, you know, the more interaction that you have with people, the uh, you know, the higher up it'll kick you in the algorithm. Uh, Wagner number, maybe skip me out here. A Wagner two that I was told was worth a bit. Yeah, uh, number two size skillets of any brand are fairly scarce. So, uh, you know, they're generally worth quite a bit of money, especially the older ones. You know, if it's the, uh, like a Wagner, if it just says Wagner in quotation marks, they use that before about 1920 or so. And uh, a number two of that would be worth quite a bit of money. I mean, something like that, you know, probably sell for around a hundred bucks or more. 
it's uh kind of hard to say right now because prices are really up in the air. Oh, thank you very much, Terry. Five dollar super chat. Yeah, num you know, uh, number twos are a real scarce size for anything, so it's probably going to be worth, you know, if it's in decent shape, it'll be worth quite a bit. Uh, threes, fives, and eights are the most common sizes because that was your small, medium, and large pan. Fours and sixes are a little bit uncommon, but they're not hugely rare. Sevens are fairly common, and uh, so are nines. But once you start getting like number 12 and bigger, they get uh, pretty scarce again. And there's a huge demand lately for uh, for the really big cast iron pans because they work great for baking. And, you know, I mean, they're a little bit tough to fry with on top of a, you know, gas or electric stove. But uh, they still can, you can still use them on a stovetop, but they're fantastic for baking or a pizza pan or something like that. Or if you're cooking outdoors, you know, but the really big ones are kind of scarce too. A uh, members only stream. If you uh, click the join button, you can, it's six ninety nine a month. You can join my YouTube channel and I do a members only stream once a month or so. And uh, I have a members only Facebook page. And on the Facebook page, I can uh, do drawings for, you know, want to get to 20 members. I'm going to do a drawing and give away some cast iron stuff here that I got. I haven't quite decided on what yet, but it'll be nice. Right now, I got 11 members. If I get to 20, you know, find nine of your friends and have them join up. And you get, you know, exclusive access. Oh, and uh, members get on all my videos. I post them a few hours early members will get uh early access to it before the general public uh back up yeah you can uh testing for lead it's not as much of a problem as some people think you know, but yeah, some people did use cast iron skillets for melting down lead for sinkers and whatnot. And, uh, but you can get lead test swabs at, uh, pretty much any hardware store, home improvement store, look in the paint department, especially because, uh, that's what most people use them for is testing for lead paint in the house, but they'll work for cast iron too. And it's most of them, the 3M swabs anyway are real easy to use. They got a little vial inside of a plastic tube. You crush the vial and it soaks into a wick on the end and you just wipe that on your thing that you're testing. And if it turns color, there's lead. If it doesn't, there isn't. Uh, unsure to do with your 100 plus pieces of vintage iron. Nobody collects or uses them in your family. Ah. Uh, well, there's a lot of things you could do. You could sell them at, uh, you know, if you're on eBay or something like that, you could sell them on eBay. You could uh, talk to an antique dealer, see if they give you an offer for them. Uh, you could stop by my house and unload them, no questions asked. You know, I'm sure I could give them a good home. Yeah, prices really vary a lot on depending on where you are. You know, I mean, if you get out in the West Coast, they're going to be a lot higher than they are around here. And some, uh, you know, and even in the same area, you can find, you know, I mean, like a lot of the uh, antique stores around here are antique malls where different people have different stalls inside a building. And you can find the same pan for five different prices in uh five different stalls you know sometimes it could be 10 20 bucks more in one than it is on the stall down the down the aisle ways oh and another thing usually you can uh you can kind of tell if a skillet has been used for melting lead because it's obviously been in a fairly hot fire and uh, it won't have much buildup on the outside. It'll be burnt off. And uh, 
lead tends to leave a little bit of residue on the inside of the pan. It'll have kind of a whitish, you know, if you've seen a car battery where you get that uh, white corrosion on the terminals, it'll be something kind of like that on there. Not necessarily, not always, but if you see something like that, you know, there's a good chance it's been used for lead. So uh, that's something to just kind of look out for. And reclusive mountain man, yeah, I just told you, you can get those little, uh, you can get little lead test swabs in hardware stores, stores all over the place. Try to keep up here with my comments. Oh, wait a minute, I think I missed, a, missed somebody here. Yeah, Lodge is nice. Is a nice. Uh, they're a good brand. They I mean it's good quality. I'm not a fan of the rougher texture, but they do season up good, and they, you know, things don't usually stick to them. And a lot of people like them, and they're a bit good, bit heavier than a lot of the older stuff. But uh, they're definitely worth the money. I mean, you can, you know, uh, you know, a ten and a half inch of number eight. Lodge skillet is usually around 20 25 bucks, and they sell them all over the place. You can get them at Walmart, you can get them a lot of places that uh sell camping supplies. They have cast iron pans in the camping supply area. Oh, there you are. Oh, Killer Miller. Oh, thank you much. 20 bucks. Yeah, I can definitely get... That'll go a long ways towards getting me a bottle of bourbon. Yeah, there's a... You know, there's a lot of people that collect. I mean, you could probably put a ad on Craigslist or your local newspaper or something like that. Uh, try and, you know, get some idea of what you got first, you know, so you don't get too ripped off. And, uh, you know, but you don't have to sell it for top dollar for everything. But if you got a decent handle on what you have, you'll definitely, uh, you know, be in your favor. Uh, something, let's see, yeah. Uh, a real handy reference book is this. You know, it's the book of Griswold and Wagner. And then there's, I can reach it. There you go. The book of Wagner and Griswold. They're put out by the same company and they have a price guide in them, but it's way out of date. I mean, the last printing of these was, I think, 2005 or so, but it'll give you a rough idea of uh, how, you know, uh, you know, it'll give you kind of a comparison if you have the difference between a number six and a number eight. If you notice there's a huge difference in the price guide. Even though the uh, price itself is 10 years, 15 years out of date, it'll kind of show you the comparative rarity and demand for things, and they come in handy. <coughs> uh, two lodge, one notch. Yeah, a lot of people like those, though, and uh, they are the older ones. The one notch lodge was made mostly in the 1930s up until the early 40s so those will uh you know those will sell for a bit more price and thank you much for wait a minute here yeah uh thank you much for reclusive mountain man now i really can get myself a nice bottle of bourbon <laughs> yeah i think i have one maybe two one notch lodges i don't have any two notch lodges but i do have a couple of threes too and they're you know they're a good bit lighter than the newer stuff and they're smoother because that's when they still machine the insides of the pan smooth go on you silly dog get out doors open well that's milo he's a rat terrier that i inherited from my kids when they had to move uh, my top three bourbons uh, wild turkey I like. Uh, wild turkey bullet is good. Bullet or bully, bullet, however you pronounce it. 
that's real good. Maker's Mark is good too. It's more expensive, but uh, got a little bit more of a harsher aftertaste to it. But I certainly wouldn't turn that on either. But yeah, mostly uh, wild turkey is probably my favorite. <laughs> yeah, that uh, silly dog. We uh, inherited him from our kid, and then I have my English Mastiff. He's running around outside right now. But Milo's actually behaving himself, because usually once I start doing something, he decides he has to go in, go out, bark at the door, make a nuisance of himself. Now he's crawling down under my feet. Yeah, you like beer? I'm not much of a beer drinker anymore. You know, I used to, but uh, probably the last 15, 20 years, you know, I just, uh, just don't drink very much beer anymore. Just stick to the hard liquor. I've been meaning to get some Knob Creek. You know, I've, uh, you know, I'm always seeing it there at the liquor store when I grab something else. One of these days I'll pick up a bottle. Give it a try. Give it a try. Uh, why do I think material quality and craftsmanship fell off? Uh, the material itself changed quite a bit because uh, of what cast iron was being used for. They've always used a certain percentage of scrap iron. You know, pretty much every foundry. They'll use, you know, some new iron right from the smelter, and they'll use a good bit of scrap iron. And uh, as we got into the automotive age, they changed the uh, formulations of cast iron so you get better wear for engine blocks and things like that. And uh, they added a bit more manganese, silicon, uh, a couple other things offhand that I can't think of. You know, but they alloyed the cast iron. It's nowhere near steel, but it uh, affected the way that it pours when you melt it down. It changes the melting point a little bit, and uh, it changes the way it flows into the molds. So they had to start making pans a little bit thicker so that it would full, you know, flow better and fill the molds right. You know, so some of it was changes in the material itself, and. Uh, you know, even the newer stuff, you know, the iron has changed even more in an engine block from 1920 to what it has right now. And that's why you can get a lot more mileage out of an engine than it used to be. It used to be, you know, 100,000 miles on an engine. It was overdue for a rebuild. You know, nowadays you can put two, three, four hundred thousand on an engine before things get too worn out. And it's because, you know, the different metallurgy. Uh, the craftsmanship that really hung on into the 50s and into the once you got into the 50s they started using uh, automated mold making machines where it would pack the sands or pack the sand around the patterns and separate the molds out by machine and they had to change the way they made the patterns so that it was suitable for the mechanized automated systems you know but uh like I said, you know, the new lodge is pretty good. They've actually gotten better. Some of the lodge that they're making in the 70s and 80s, you know, it really isn't that good. It's passable, but it's not anything terribly fantastic. But the stuff they're making now is a lot better. I mean, they've gotten a lot better with the uh, automation over the years, so they're getting it back to where it's better made. I really wish they'd come back with machining the insides of the pans. But they eliminated that as a cost saving step because it was an extra step that cost money. Machinery cost money. People operate the machines cost money. So, you know, they uh, got rid of that. And it saved the company. I mean, they're still in business. They didn't get uh, chased out by cheap imports. So I guess you can't complain too much about it. Hey, the town eccentric. I haven't seen you in ages. Yeah, a lot of people really like the old uh, Lodge pans. I mean, they're good pans. They're nice and smooth, and they're, you know, a good bit lighter than the uh, than the ones they make nowadays. Yeah, I like Scotch too, and uh, you know, Irish whiskey. You know, uh, 
Bush Mills and Jameson are both really good. You know, I'm not much of a scotch snob. You know, if people start rattling off all these different single malt scotches, I couldn't tell you one from the other. But if it tastes good, I'd certainly drink it. Yeah, it was kind of important, but, you know, they can get away with a little rougher surface, so they do. You know, a lot of the, uh, there's a few other manufacturers of cast iron cookware in the U.S., Pinex, Stargazer, uh, Field Company, and they machine the insides of their pans, but, uh, you know, they're $150, $200 brand new pans too, so... You know, kind of a six of one, half a dozen of the other. You know, I mean, a lot of the uh, vintage pans are actually a good bit cheaper than some of the new ones. But, you know, I mean, it's really only, you know, something you really only got to buy once, you know, because you're never going to wear it out. Uh, any updates on Needy Homesteader? Yeah, Heather's doing fairly good. You know, she's... uh She's uh, recovering good from the head injury. And, uh, you know, she's met all the goals within about a week or so that they were thinking it would take her two or three weeks as far as, you know, cognition and such. And uh, she got the cast off her wrist today. I'm sure they're going to put her back in, uh, you know, splints for the time being, but she's out of the hard cast on her arms. And other than that, you know, I mean, I'm not sure when she's going to... Uh, get back home. I mean, I'm sure that'll still be another four or five weeks, at least I would think until her legs heal up good enough that she can, uh, start moving around. Uh, 300,000 on her GoFundMe. Yeah, that's really good. You know, last I saw it was a little over 200, but she's going to end up with some huge bills, even with insurance because, uh, you know, nursing home stays are really expensive. And a lot of those are, 60, 70, 80,000 a month if you're paying cash for it. The, uh, I'm sure her insurance will pick up some of it, but if she's there more than a month or two, you know, it's hard to say. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's that's a lot of money and it really sounds like a lot, but, you know, a lot of that's going to turn right around and go back out for medical bills on this, I'm sure. Oh, you like my stove? Yeah, that's quite the quite the old stove. Yeah, rough, you know, a surface doesn't have to be really rough, rough, because, you know, it doesn't have to be rough like, a, you know, a really grainy, gritty, cheap imported pan is. No, they're really hard to season, actually. But it needs to be kind of scuffed up. You know, it needs to have a little bit of ridges and stuff. If uh, you ever see a microscopic photograph of the surface of cast iron it's got tons of little ridges and grooves in it and that's what the uh seasoning need, seasoning really needs to bond to it's way finer than what you would it feels you know glassy smooth to the touch but it's actually got quite a bit of texture to it uh my it's got my nose a little bit ah. uh my background i'm a laborer by trade which means i've built and destroyed all kinds of different things over the years so and uh you know just keeping things running around out in the boonies here you get pretty good at fabricating and you just start looking into things you pick up all kinds of information that's out there yeah my beard is doing pretty good today it's a Happy day for my facial hair. Yeah, they're kind of kind of a pain to move, those old stoves are. But uh, it's surprising, this one at least is surprisingly light once you get most of the, uh, get as much of the stuff off of it as you can. You take the tops off and the warming oven and uh, the uh, reservoir, once you get all that off, the part that's left isn't really all that heavy. I mean, it's not light by any stretch of imagination, but it's, uh, you know, two men can move it around fairly easily. 
Yeah, it's just like the uh, second coat of paint on a car. You know, you have to have it, you know, a little bit of a tooth to it, to what's underneath of it to bond the next layer on. Anyway. Bolso curly makes you look like a terrorist. Well, a terrorist ain't a bad thing to look like sometimes. It keeps the riffraff away. Don't have people don't have people bothering you all the time. Yeah, we got the bottom turned around over deer hunting season. Had some help out here and made him give me a hand lifting the stove and spinning it around. Can't believe it did that when I put it down. You know, didn't even bother to you know, got it all lined up perfect. I want it right here. It's square to the wall. It's centered up on the stove pipe. And it's backwards. <laughs> uh, doing the electrolysis, yeah. I'm probably going to start, you know, I'll probably be into uh, April or so when I get around to setting up my electrolysis tank again outside because uh, I don't really want to do it in the house because, uh, you know, of course, it's too cold to do it outside. It'll freeze up solid. But, uh, you know, producing hydrogen and oxygen gas next to a fire is not really the best idea. It doesn't make a uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of hydrogen, and uh, when you're doing electrolysis, but it does make some. And you know, it's best to keep that sort of thing outside or where it's really well ventilated. Yeah, it is electrolysis where you hook up to the battery charger and run the current through it. Yeah, I'll be doing that, uh, like I said, probably towards the end of April once it starts staying above freezing at night. You know, if it skims over a little ice, that doesn't really hurt anything, but, uh, you know, I don't want it to go freezing solid and break the tub. Anyhow, I've been at this for an hour and a minute. Uh, do I have any issues with creosote buildup? No, not really. You know, you just got to keep your chimney swept and stay at it. And uh, both my chimneys, I can sweep them from inside. I don't have to screw around crawling up on the roof and trying to do it. And, uh, you know, I guess run a brush up through the bottom of the chimney. It's a lot easier than it is uh, going outside and scrambling up an icy, snowy roof and trying to sweep it out from the outside. Yeah, Brenda, uh, watch for that video, you know, uh, you know, in, you know, probably towards middle of April, end of April, and that'll uh, I'll get her set up out there and do a little more detailed setup on running it and different uh, things you can do with it. Yeah, I do the same thing. I soak them in lye first and get most of the stuff off of them, and then in the uh, electrolysis tank because it's a lot faster running it through the electrolysis after you've stripped the crud off of them because. Uh, you know, the electrolysis is kind of a choke point. You can do, you know, 15, 20 pans in a big tub of lye, but you can only do one at a time in my electrolysis rig. I could probably set it up where I could do a couple because I've got a big, a big, uh, you know, it's a 40 amp, you know, wheeled floor charger like you'd have in a garage. You know, I got one at a pawn shop because I need something to, jump start my tractor when it's really cold and uh something like that i could probably set up where i could run a couple of pans at the same time but it you know goes through a lot faster you know you can uh after you have the crud off the electrolysis will only take about a day maybe 12 14 hours for most things it'll be nice and clean and you can switch a pan let it go overnight and just keep going like that Where uh, if you're using the electrolysis right from the start to strip the crud off and the rust at the same time, it'll usually take two or three days a lot of times to do it, to uh, get her clean. Uh, no, the cook stove is just sitting on the floor. It doesn't. It sits up high enough, and the firebox itself is quite a ways above the bottom of the stove. So uh, there's no problem with heat underneath of it on the hardwood floor. And uh, hot cinders, no, you don't really get a whole lot of stuff falling out of it. 
you know, it, it can't happen, you know, especially if you're feeding it through that little door, that little slanted door you can see on the front there. You know, if uh, something falls against that and you open it up, you can have something fall out. But if you grab it quick, it's not going to burn much. And usually I just feed it through the top anyway. So, yeah, if you make soap, you're not going to have any problem handling a lye bath. Just don't get any on you. It's the first rule of chemical safety. Anyhow, yeah, I've been at this a little better than an hour now, so I'm going to wrap this up. And I'll see you again next week. Remember to uh, click the like button on the video if you're so inclined. Join the channel. And I was going to say something at the end of my video, and I forgot entirely what it was. Ah, uh, well. Anyhow, thank you much for coming, and we will see you next time around. Bye.